So the prior videos in this module were recorded several years ago. And as Jan mentioned, the heap kind of goes through cycles of emphasizing efficiency versus security versus efficiency. And it's not that one's more important than the other. There's always a trade-off going for something that's more efficient versus going for something that's more secure. Anytime that you add a you know, mitigation technique, something to try and make uh, a system more secure, there's always some kind of cost to it, whether it's uh, a resource cost, uh, a real cost, or a human cost. And, and so there, there's always trade-offs there. And, you know, as far as what the focus is, that kind of depends on the flavor of the month. It depends on what's on developers' minds. It depends on what's in the news, right? Just kind of what's trending. Uh, as of late, security has been kind of a hot topic. And so when we talk about the heat, there's definitely some mitigation techniques that are implemented in singly linked list heap implementations uh, like Tcash or Fastbin uh, that are worth talking about. And so in this video, we're going to talk about one of the kind of prevention uh, exploit prevention techniques uh, that exists, uh, and it's called safe linking. And so we're going to take a look at what safe linking attempts to prevent. Uh, we're then going to look at how those prevention mechanisms are implemented. And then we're going to discuss how effective these prevention mechanisms are and how a committed attacker uh, can get around them. So we're going to approach this from the attacker's viewpoint. And for an attacker, if you're doing a heap exploit, uh, a very common thing that you'll want to try and do, or juicy target, uh, is going to be a pointer on the heap, right? Like the for Tcash, it would be the next pointer. And there's a couple of reasons that the next pointer is interesting to an attacker. The first is if I can read it. If I can read that value, I can eliminate some randomness as far as ASLR on the heap. I've eliminated the random bytes that exist in that space. If I can read that next pointer, I also gain some information about the layout of memory on the heap. So I now have some idea of where another chunk is located. And for an advanced heap exploit, that may be very critical information for me to pull off an exploit. Now, alternatively, I could try and overwrite this next pointer. And the reason I'd be interested in overwriting the next pointer is because when the chunk is freed, or I'm sorry, not freed, when the chunk is uh, malloced, the next pointer becomes the next chunk. Everything moves up the list. And so if set up correctly, and malloc is called a number of times, that next value can get returned by malloc as a valid pointer. And that's an extremely powerful thing to have. Because if malloc is being called, then the program that is calling malloc likely performs reads or writes on that, on that pointer. Right? There's a reason that the program called malloc in the first place. And so by overwriting this next pointer, it's a very common pathway to get an arbitrary read or an arbitrary write. If I can control this next pointer and get malloc to return it, there's a very high chance that I can read or write anywhere uh, that I choose to uh, in memory. Now, safe linking attempts to prevent this, and it does so by mangling and messing up that next pointer value in the free chunk. And so inside every free chunk, that next pointer gets XOR. It gets XOR with some random bytes. And so this kind of messes up the attacker on both fronts. If I'm the attacker and I'm reading this mangled next value, well, the value has been XOR. It's been messed up. So I don't learn anything about the ASLR bytes, right? Because those have, those have been XOR. And so it's not immediately obvious what well, what does the memory space look like? And because it's a mangled pointer that's been XORed, I also can't look at it and have any idea where the next trunk is located. So I don't gain any information about the layout of memory, uh, of heap memory, that, that I could possibly manipulate. So I don't gain any information by, by viewing this value. Now, if I'm going to try and overwrite it, I could overwrite it and, and put my own value there. But as we'll see in a couple slides, that will also not be very effective because of this mangling and demangling. So safe linking come, 
comes down to two, just two simple rules. Uh, the first we just saw, which is the TCache next pointers uh, must be mangled uh, for free chunks. So it's XORed with some random bytes, and that makes it difficult for the attacker to read and gain information, and it makes it difficult for the attacker to overwrite that and, and have a successful outcome. Uh, the second rule is demangled pointers. So they're stored here in a mangled state. But at some point, that next value needs to get converted back to a valid pointer so that malloc can return a valid pointer. And after the demangling procedure, the rule is the pointer's least significant nibble must be zero. Now, this second rule doesn't seem like much, but it does have an impact to an attacker. Uh, the first is if I try and just write my own mangled, messed up value, I have to get lucky because the least significant nibble must XOR with the random bytes such that the least significant nibble is zero. And so that automatically makes it more likely that I'm going to just fail because the fail state is greater. Additionally, because the demangled pointer must be zero, that means there are a large number of valid memory addresses that simply cannot be returned by malloc, right? Uh, like a totally valid memory address, as far as like offset alignment on a 64-bit system is just something that ends in eight, right? Most valid memory addresses that you're working with are eight byte aligned. So it's, it's zero or eight. Well, it turns out if you're going to get a pointer from the heap, eight is no longer an option. And so for an attacker, this means that I may be interested in a memory location that ends in eight, but I can't get the heap to return a pointer that is exactly what I want. And so this causes additional complexity and kind of additional headache for an attacker. And so we'll see that these two simple rules prevent a large number of just like classical heap attacks. It doesn't prevent all of them. Uh, and the heap attacks that still can occur, uh, they still work, but they're going to require a bit more effort to pull off because we have to account for uh, these two rules. So let's go back to thinking like an attacker and we're going to try and pull off an exploit. And so we're gonna try and overwrite this next pointer. And from Jan's earlier videos, we saw that the most recently freed chunk is at the head of the list. And the head pointer is stored in the tcache per thread struct. And it has a list of counts and then a pointer to the head or to the first entry for that bit. And so as an attacker, we'll assume that somehow I've obtained uh, a pointer to this, this freed chunk. And so my, my strategy is I'm going to try and overwrite this next pointer because I want to control that and see if I can get malloc to return a value I'm interested in. Now, the intended chunk is going to be chunk two over here. And chunk two uh, has the next pointer as well, right? But that doesn't matter because right now we're focused on chunk one. And so as an attacker, I'm going to overwrite this next, this next pointer. And when I do that, we now have a new next value there. Now, nothing has really occurred, right? We've just overwritten this. Now, if you've done some of the problems in the module here, uh, you've seen that in this type of a state, you can call malloc. And when you do that, chunk one uh, will get returned by malloc. And then new next would get dereferenced. And so the head of that bin, the, the next entry to be returned by malloc becomes whatever was in new next. In this case, it's not a chunk two, because more than likely an attacker isn't going to overwrite the next pointer with a valid chunk. They're going to overwrite it with some, uh, it's just some address in memory that they're interested in. As long as the heap doesn't explode, you know, doesn't crash, the attacker doesn't really care. It only needs to not break for long enough to accomplish what you need. Now, this is what happens without safe linking, right? That new next value gets passed up into the tcash per thread struct, and whatever the attacker defined will be the next thing that's returned by malloc. However, 
with safe linking, uh, what we see is that new next value, before it gets loaded up into the tcash per thread struct, it goes through a demangling phase, right? Because we have to un-XOR it via XOR because it's, you know, a reversible operation there. But still, the demangling procedure is going to change the value of new next. So instead of looking at something like this, the attacker ends up with something like this. And so the head entry of the bin will point to some mangled address. More than likely, it'll be an invalid memory address you know, that isn't even uh, dereferenceable. Additionally, because we have that rule that the least significant nibble must be zero, there's a very good chance that this address will not even be properly aligned, uh, which means that it can result in the heap causing the whole program to just stop because of an alignment issue. And so this is a problem for the attacker. Now, despite being quite the, the headache for the attacker, the implementation of safe linking is, is surprisingly simple. Uh, it is really just these three lines, which are just C macros. So let's take a look at them here. We have protect pointer, which takes a position and a pointer. The position value is bit shifted to the right by 12 bits. So what's the significance of this 12 bits? Well, if you recall from the memory module, uh, we encountered something called ASLR, and it's been around now for a while uh, in the modules and out and out about in the world. Uh, but the first three nibbles of a memory address are offsets into a page, we said. And so though those tend to be you know, pretty consistent. After that are random byte values that, that are generated that are different every time the program runs due to address space layout randomization, ASLR. And so when we bit shift by 12 bits, what we're doing is we are moving those random bits or those random bytes from ASLR up to the front of this position value because we want these random bytes uh, to be XORed into the pointer. And that's what we see here. So we move the randomness to the front of position. Uh, we then XOR with the pointer, and that gives us a mangled value. Now, if we look at the implementation of reveal pointer, reveal pointer is defined as protect pointer. It's protect pointer with the address of a pointer with the pointer's value. And so in both cases, it's just a reversible XOR. So let's think about this from the attacker standpoint. Well, where are these, these functions used? Where are these macros implemented? Well, if we take a look here, reveal pointer is inside malloc. Specifically, it's inside tcache get because malloc returns pointers. So that is getting something from the tcache and returning it to whoever called malloc. And if we look at this snippet here, or this uh, block of code, the first thing we see is the tcache entry, E, is pulled from the head of the bin. So tcache entries index, that is grabbing the head entry for the correct bin from the tcache per thread struct. And so it's getting the first entry. It then checks that entry to see if it's aligned. This right here is where that does the least significant nibble equals zero check is occurring. We're saying, is, is this entry aligned? If it's not aligned, we see malloc print error, unaligned tcast chunk detected, and then the heap is done. The program elects it. Next, we see here this reveal pointer, which is what we initially were kind of focused on. Now, reveal pointer is being called on E next. So that's going to be the heads next pointer. And that's going to get demangled and stored in the head entry of the tcash per thread struct. So inside the tcash per thread struct, are demangled pointers, but everything outside of the tcash per thread struct is a mangled pointer. 
We then decrement the count because we're malloking and returning from the bins, and we return the entry that we know is properly aligned. Now, what happens inside of free? Well, very similar, except this is where the protect pointer operation occurs. So this is where we are going to mangle something and then push it onto the tcache um, list. And so here we have tcache put because, again, we are putting an entry onto the list. And so we're going to convert a chunk to an entry. We're going to set the key value, which Jan described what the key is in earlier modules. It should just be a pointer to the tcache per thread struct. Uh, we then see protect pointer is called. And protect pointer is called on the address of next, right, with the tcache head entry. And that is what gets stored in E next. So we're going to take the address of E next with the thing that was at the head, mangle, you know, XOR them together, and that is the mangled value that will get stored in E next as the next pointer, the mangled next pointer. And so that, that is how safe linking works. Uh, there are other calls if you want to see the source code. There are other places where protect pointer and reveal pointer are used uh, in the heap in general. But as far as tcache goes, these are the two key areas uh, that, that you should focus on. So we've seen where these, these macros are used. But what do we know about the actual implementation here? We said it's really simple. They're like, there's got to be something we can do as an attacker. So let's take a closer look at the actual macros, or the actual functions that are occurring here. So we know XOR is reversible, right? So let's look at this protect pointer. Well, we said that it's XORing this position value with the pointer, but I don't necessarily know the position value. So I need two different values here. I need to have this position and I need to have the pointer. And so protect pointer, at least, you know, by looking at it here initially, like it cannot be reversed without two values. So I need to have both of these things in order to try and reason about how I'm going to XOR it. What about reveal pointer? Well, reveal pointer, if you'll recall, is defined by protect pointer. And so we can substitute in the arguments here, uh, which is the address of pointer with the value of pointer into protect pointer. And so what do we end up with? We end up with something that looks like this. So reveal pointer is going to XOR the pointer value with the address of the pointer bit shifted by 12 bits. Now, if the pointers that were used here were randomly located in memory, this would be a difficult problem. But all of this is occurring in the heap, which means that, and we're bit shifting away the offset into the page, these 12 bits. So the more than likely, the address of pointer bit shifted 12 is going to be equivalent to the pointer itself, assuming that the pointer points to the heap. The It's going to be, the pointer bit shifted 12 is going to be roughly equivalent, like most of the time, to the address of the pointer bit shifted by 12. And this knowledge is key to realizing that this reveal pointer function is fully reversible from the mangled value alone. Now, I'm not going to show you how to do it. I, I'm sure you can look it up. Uh, but if you play around with just I, I Python, like in, in a terminal here, and, and look at this and think about it, you'll figure out how you can reverse this. So you can take one value, that mangled value, and get back a valid heat pointer. Now this has some implications. So if we can reverse this reveal pointer function, well, we said protect pointer cannot be reversed without two values.
But one of those values that we needed was this position value. And this position value is a valid heat pointer. So if I can reverse reveal pointer to get a valid heat pointer, then I can use that valid heat pointer in protect pointer to then reverse the value of protect pointer. Uh, and so you can, once you get a mangled pointer value, turn that into a valid pointer value or heat pointer value, and then use that valid heat pointer value to then remangle things before you write them into freed um, into freed chunks next pointers. And so you can do the mangling yourself once you collect enough information here so that you don't write a clear text value. You mangle it yourself and write a mangled value because you understand and know how the heap is going to demangle it. And all this requires is one leak. It's still one more leak than you used to have to have because you used to not have to have the leak at all. And so you do have to get a heap leak before you can begin this kind of mangling and demangling yourself. And when you start doing more complicated heap exploits, where there may be multiple allocations involved and many pointers that may or may not be on the heap, it becomes a lot more complicated. But just to get something that is passable into the next pointer, it's actually not that hard once you have an initial heap leak. So the takeaways here in thinking about safe linking, right? It does add additional requirements to most heap exploits. Most of the time you're trying to interact with the metadata that is in free chunks. And the next pointer is a prime target for a lot of reasons. The, these alignment checks, making sure that the, the least significant nibble uh, is zero, directly prevents, even when you can do this demangling and mangling, it doesn't matter if I can do the mangling and demangling, there are still addresses that you cannot get the heap to return to you. And so as an attacker, what you'll try and do is return something that is just preceding it or just after it, depending upon the context. Maybe I can return a pointer that comes before what I'm interested in, and then I have to do some padding to get something to print out. I have to write, I can get something that's eight bytes before the thing I'm interested in that I want to read. So then I have to pad eight A's and then call like print put string, right? And so you have to get a bit more creative in how you're going to try and utilize the pointers that are returned by malware. And so that this leads to additional like hiccups and complications when you're trying to write your exploits. Uh, as I mentioned, because of this mangling and demangling, even though it is reversible, to be able to reverse it, you have to have uh, a heat pointer leak. It can be a mangled heat pointer, to be clear, but ultimately because you can turn a mangled uh, heat pointer into a valid heat pointer. Uh, just with its uh, just with the information contained in the mangled um, pointer. So yeah, a mangled pointer is is totally valid in this case. I just want to make sure I'm clear about that. So getting a mangled heat pointer, you can turn that into a valid heat pointer. And once you have that heat pointer leak, you can begin to mangle things yourself. You can't mangle things until you get a valid heat pointer, though. And all of this, uh, as I mentioned leads to a lot more complications trying to do complex heap exploits, uh, like massaging the heap or creating overlapping allocations or getting, you know, getting overlapping allocations so that you can then get, uh, overwrite a pointer to then get a read, or you're trying to, for instance, put a stack value somewhere in the heap or a libc value somewhere in the heap. Well, all of a sudden, you know, the, some of these assumptions that existed like this one here, about this being fully reversible because the address of the pointer uh, should be in the same memory region as the pointer itself is not necessarily true uh, because all of a sudden you're putting values from different memory regions together and XORing them. 
And that can definitely cause some issues for an attacker trying to do a more complicated exploit because you have to be very aware of what value is getting XORed with the other value to mangle it correctly such that safe linking doesn't break. And so it is an effective deterrent. It is a good mitigation technique, right? It, it causes more work for the attacker, uh, but it certainly isn't a cure-all. Uh, and for an attacker that is knowledgeable about how this mechanism works, and they put in the time uh, to obtain the correct information, like getting a heat pointer leak, uh, it certainly can be uh, overcome by a, deter by a determined attacker. So that's uh, what I have to say about safe linking. Uh, there are some new challenges that are being added to the dojo here uh, that will be using safe linking. So you'll get to uh, see how safe linking uh, changes and impacts how heap exploitation works.